on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. We give you what we're watching for and preview OU UCF with Brandon Helwig. We also preview the other best games of week eight of college football and give you our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, October 18th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of October, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this Wednesday morning, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Ted Lehman, how we doing, sir? Doing fantastic. Uh, looking forward to this game. Bye week. Texas game feels like uh, it was a long time ago, so it's good to get this thing rolling again. Yeah, and an interesting opponent. Yeah. For the Sooners, a little uncertainty surrounding this UCF team. Now, before we get into what we're watching for in this matchup, some podcast updates. Riverwind Casino, our good friends at Riverwind Casino. They have agreed to sponsor the In the Weeds videos on our YouTube channel. So we are going to have some more of those coming y'all's way. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. By the way, subscribing is free. It costs you nothing. Also, I'm told when I listen to other podcasts, they say like the video and comment. That's what they tell me. I don't know what it does, but apparently it helps us out. So we're going to have some more of that stuff coming y'all's way. And then we have also, yesterday, we signed a contract to do a live podcast at Coop Ale Works Tap Room in Oklahoma City on the night of November 29th. We'll have some more details, obviously, coming on that. But exciting stuff. Ted, look at the podcast growing. We've got all kinds of things happening. It's going to be awesome. The uh, the In the Weed stuff, I think, is going to be really fun. And uh, I'm nervous about going live. What are we going to do? I I don't know. <laughs> but we're going to do our best to try to provide an entertaining show. Uh, you and I, we're going to have to brainstorm on what that's going to look like. But that's in the future. Let's live in the present, Ted. Let's be where our feet are. Yeah. OU UCF on Saturday. Let's start on the defensive side of the ball for the Sooners. What are you watching for from OU's defense against UCF's offense? Well, the most interesting storyline, I guess, coming into this is quarterback. Um, what's John Rice Plumley going to look like? Um, you know, they said he's going to get the start. Uh, does he play the whole game? He's got a knee issue going on. They tried to bring him back against Kansas. Did not go well. Um, he's had some time since then. I don't think he's going to be close to himself, which we only saw a, a brief flash of that this season, and he looked pretty good. Uh, he can run around. He can make some plays. Um but he's not a pocket quarterback. He needs access to all of his athleticism to to really be, uh, you know, what they want him to be. So that's the main thing to watch. Now, as far as what you're going to get from their offense, I say that this is responsibility football week. You are going to get a bunch of different concepts. You're going to get a bunch of different window dressing with motions and misdirection and zone read and option and RPOs. It's it's a big mix of everything. Um, you know, it's interesting starting in the run game. You're going to see 
traditional just split zone back in the uh in the shotgun next to the quarterback uh, a tight end offset off of the ball h back coming across the formation traditional split zone but then they'll do reverse split zone where the tight end comes like from the backside to the front side it's a weird play i don't know why people do it but um you'll get that from them you'll get the split zone read where the quarterback is reading the defensive end to see if he's going to keep it and sometimes he'll keep it and then they'll throw the bubble off of that as well so you'll have like there's it's like triple new age triple option Running back has a chance to keep it. Quarterback has a chance to keep it. And then he'll throw the bubble on the outside. Um, they'll also do the reverse zone read where the quarterback is now faking the, they do it out of jet sweep a lot. He's faking the jet sweep, reading the edge, and he may give it to the jet sweep around the corner, or he may keep it and they'll run it up the middle, and they'll usually run some type of center or guard pull and fold on the inside if the quarterback's going to keep it on the inside. Um, You'll get some stuff out of bunch. I expect to see some bunch with this group. Um, You'll get some stuff out of bunch. Um, You know, whenever you've got bunch, you've got access to the split zone, really all of the same stuff, but it starts in a bunch formation, and they will do some end-around stuff and like ghost motion out of bunch. Um, now you'll you'll get sprint pass, and off of sprint pass, they run the old school smoke draw or sprint draw, where you know the quarterback looks backs off set, let's say to the right. Quarterback takes a snap, and it looks like sprint pass. He's going to sprint out. Back takes like a half a step, and then just freezes. And the quarterback runs by him and sticks it in his gut, and he comes back kind of across the grain. And it's weird how the offensive line blocks it. They do this thing where they just turn sideways. It it's weird. It's also stupid. <laughs> I really I am it. I'm a big sprint draw guy. I think it's an incredibly effective play. Their ball handling on it is really good. I don't understand why they block it that way. I'm just I it's someone's old. gonna have to explain that to me. It's it's old and so they they try to get you to cross their face and they will you. So it's it's really weird. Um, what's it's what's funny about it is Alabama ran that against us in 2002 when they came to Norman, and whenever we were preparing for the game, we had like we had a bunch of like discussion on how to how to play it, and then finally Coach Venables is like. Just when you see it, just go, just fly through the first gap you see, which is not typically how we fit things. It's all like very schematically sound. And we did that. And I had like three or four tackles for loss in that game. So I loved it. But the interesting thing, we stole that and ran it against Texas that year. And that's the year Quentin Griffin had like a huge year running that smoke draw play. So that's kind of an interesting little backstory. But You'll see that, I mean, once, maybe twice a game, if that. Um, they'll run counter. Um, they ran outside zone with the wipe, Gabe. Did you see that play where the center wipes around the backside? So that was pretty interesting. Um, but really, to me, it's all about responsibility football. Play your gap. I think the offensive line is solid, not great. Um, If we maintain gap integrity, play what we're supposed to do, I think we should do well. I think the two backs are actually really good. Um, Seven, Harvey is powerful. He runs low. He's got good balance and leg churn. Uh, Richardson is the fast back. Took an 80-yarder on the first play of the game against Baylor on a little jet outside concept. They do like a – he'll start in the backfield and looks like he's going to motion out to empty. He takes like three or four steps and then stops and then comes flying back across. So they get kind of a jet concept with the running back. Um, But he's fast and impressive. Uh, To me, we should 
really do a good job against this offense. The kind of flyer or the thing that has me questioning is what does Plumley look like? If he's able to run around, scramble, um, you know, make plays down the field in the in the scramble drill, then I think that would be the way that they have success. Because the passing game appears to me that other than like sprint pass, I, they'll do some like little screen stuff, like a swing screen to the back or a, a, a Y screen on action away. Other than that, it's almost exclusively matchup go balls with an over route underneath it. That's, a, that's about all you're going to get from in the passing game. And it's, it's, they'll do some of the stuff. If you'll remember Baylor, whenever Baylor would go match up, this is old school Baylor match up and go balls. Everyone else will just kind of stand there and watch. They've come to the line. They've identified where they're going with it. That's our matchup. And everyone else just kind of stands there and watches. They'll do that as well. So it's going to be difficult for them to find a matchup that they like. They do have, some good speed at wide receiver. Hudson uh, is a leading receiver. He's a transfer from Auburn. And then uh, Baker is a transfer for Alabama. So they've got some SEC players at wide receiver. But as far as concepts, they're not going to give you a bunch of different route tree combinations. It's it's all matchups. So I happen to like our matchups. So I think that's going to be a difficult game for them. I'm with you. I think... It's very similar to the conversation we have a lot of times with a mobile quarterback. And you're right. John Rice Plumley, he's not going to be himself. When he's healthy, he can go. Mm-hmm. Like he's fast, fast. But that knee clearly, clearly is not healthy. But it, it's the same goal. Make him play from the pocket. Yeah. Make him beat you throwing the football. Make him tough accurate throws in tight windows. If you can do that, you're going to be just fine. I am looking forward to you losing your mind when they throw an RPO, when both guards are blocking both inside backers. I cannot wait. It is going to, because they do it. They've got some RPO stuff in their system and they like to throw that slant in behind the backers. And I've seen it multiple times on tape where both inside backers have their hands up trying to deflect the slant and they are being engaged by (laughs) offensive linemen. And I cannot wait for you to freak out on the broadcast as a result of that. Yeah. um, And I, I failed to mention the RPO game. Um, It's interesting. They do. And this isn't exclusive to UCF, but it's the rare RPO where the quarterback will turn here and he's reading the safety on the backside, and he'll pull it and throw the slant away from where the exchange is. Um, you don't see that one nearly as much, but they do that one. They do that one quite a bit. It's it's a routine play for them. And you know, just listening to Coach Venables talk about it on Monday night at Rudy's, I, he, he thinks that the RPO game is much more fluid and efficient with Plumley at the helm. Which I mean makes sense but like that's one of the main benefits of getting him back even if he's not full go scrambling and running around and using his full speed just kind of the efficiency running some of those those key schemes that they have should be better i think i think OU is going to give up some big plays in this game just because they've had an extra week to prepare malzon's really creative yeah they're going to have some stuff where you go okay that was really good But the key is that those plays that they hit you on aren't, you know, catastrophic, right? They're not big, long touchdowns. And and I know that Venables will have the defense ready to roll. But the only other thing I have after watching the tape of UCF's offense is our safeties and corners are going to need to get off blocks and tackle well. Yeah. They have so many concepts that attack what I call the alley in the defense. So safeties and they've got guys with speed, right? Townsend number three. He looks, he looks like a poor man's Tyreek Hill. Like when you see the way he moves and his body type, you're like, 
that could be Tyreek Hill's cousin. Like is kind of how I view it. And then Richardson zero, right? You mentioned his big playability, the stuff that they do with both of those guys to attack the alleys with speed sweeps, different concepts. They really force your defensive backs to come up and make plays. And so far this season, OU's defensive backs have done a really good job in those situations. They need to continue to do a really good job against this team because they do have a couple guys that they're going to get the ball on the edges to that can hurt you if you miss tackles. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, one last thing, and I don't know if you heard Venables talk about this on the on the Rudy show, but, you know, the SMU game, there's a lot of similarities and carryover. Um, you know, they tried, because you mentioned all the the gadgets and stuff you may see from Malzahn with the creativity. SMU tried a bunch of that stuff against Oklahoma. And that was kind of a good tune-up. Rhett Lashley played quarterback for Gus Malzahn. He was his offensive coordinator at Auburn. So there's a lot of similarities and carryover between those two offenses. And that's definitely the approach that Lashley took. So, yeah throwbacks, uh, kind of hidden wheel routes on the backside, um, uh, away from the action, maybe some throwback, throwback screen stuff, um, maybe double pass misdirection on like that zone read where you throw the bubble, you could get double pass or something off of that. So that is a good point, um, that you're going to have to have your antenna up with all of the misdirection and stuff happening that they're going to try and sneak something out on you. Anything else? That's what we're watching for. All right, let's talk about what we're watching for from OU's offense versus UCF's defense. Wanted to start here. And Jeff Levy would never say this. This one is personal for him. I believe. Mm -hmm. He hasn't told me that. He hasn't said it publicly. But I firmly believe he thought he was going to be the head football coach at UCF. And they ended up going with Malzahn instead. I don't think there's a game that Jeff Levy wants to light up the scoreboard more than this game. I think it's very personal for him. Right? And I think there were a lot of people around that program, within that program, that thought he was going to be the next head coach at UCF. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. As we head into this football game, looking at UCF's defense, I see UCF as a 4-2-5 team. Uh, Traymond Morris Brash, who's got some good numbers. When you look at you, know, you look at the stats, he's labeled as their buck. He's just a defensive end that plays standing up. That's what he is. And with OU being a team that majors in 11 personnel, right, one back, one tight end, you're mostly going to see an even front, right? So two guys on the line of scrimmage on each side of the center. Now they have shown the ability to jump into odd spacing and Morris Brash is still just standing up. So it'll look like a three-man front with an overhang player, number three. But when I watch their defense, I do not think UCF has the defensive personnel to line up keep things simple, play straight, and hold up against OU's offense. I, I, I think their defensive line is solid. I, I think they're a physical group. I just don't think they're overly talented. I think they're going to have to do some things. I think they're going to have to slant and angle their front. Uh, I think they're going to need to dial up some pressure. Ted, so part of game planning for this game for OU's offensive staff and those players, I, I think they're going to have to do some guessing what those pressure packages could look like because I just do not see UCF lining up, saying, all right, let's get this on. We're going to play straight. I just I don't see him holding up that way. Yeah, well, you would hope that they couldn't. They shouldn't be able to. Um if we're legitimately a, you know, top five football team going up against a team that's just now coming to the first power five conference, like that, 
that is exactly how it should be. Right? They should have to do some things against you to try and even things out a little bit. Um, and we've got smart coaches. They know that. And whenever you have to get aggressive defensively and take some risks, you're giving up something on the back end. All right. You can't just you can't just add players to the mix, add things to the mix without giving something up. And our coaches have to, you know, they'll have a game plan of what they think is going to happen and how they're going to take advantage of it. Um, there may also be where they're in the game and once they see what it is they're going to do, you kind of adjust on the fly and find a way to to really expose their aggressiveness. So I, that should yield some very explosive plays for Oklahoma. I'm with you. Okay, some run game thoughts. First and foremost, what's OU's offensive line going to look like? I haven't talked to anyone, so this is not any inside knowledge. I I just look at this situation and think, what would I do if it was up to me? What makes the most sense? Uh, Matoyer is going to miss some time. Right, that was a that was a bad ankle injury. So, I believe it's time. Right until Matoya is back, it's time to get your most talented five guys on the field. And when I look at that group, I believe OU's most talented five has Caden Green at one guard and Savion Bird at the other. And I understand that Caleb Schaefer is a captain for this game. And I expect him to play at right guard. I do. But if it was up to me, I would start Caden green at left guard. And I would start Savion bird at right guard because you've had a couple of weeks now with the bye, you've had some time to get Savion more comfortable flipping sides. Caden green. He's a true freshman. He's been working at left guard. So it probably makes the most sense for him do not flip, right? It makes more sense for a guy who's been in the system longer to flip over to the other side. But, Ted, that's what I would do. I, I'm not sure what it's going to look like on Saturday, but if it were up to me, that's what it would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least there's some options to play with. You know, Caden Green at left. Um, uh, Savion maybe play some right. You may get what Troy Everett uh, play some left as well behind I, Caden and Schaefer at right behind Bird. Troy Everett's future is at center. Yeah, I think, I think you get Savion Bird and and Caden Green reps at guard now. And I've said it before. I think, I think Troy Everett's going to be a good center down the line at Oklahoma. But there are better options at guard, in my opinion. So that's that's what the O-line would look like on Saturday. The first O-line, I think they're going to play multiple guys. But the O-line would be Rouse, Green, Rame, Bird, Guyton. I'd like and when that. you think about that, how that lineup's going to look, start getting real excited. Yeah, I'd like that. I, if if, if Savion Burke can go out and play four quarters of football at a high level, stay locked in mentally, and I honestly, it's what we need. It's it's one of the things that we've been missing is that size, explosiveness, um, you know, a little bit of anger there on the interior. So I, I'd love to see it. Yeah, I do think OU can find success in the run game. I am convinced. I've talked myself into it, Ted. This is the week the chunk runs come. Yes. My, my bold prediction on Monday night at Rudy's was that they would have three runs of 30-plus yards. I heard that. I, I, heard I think they can do it because when, when you watch the tape, I think the zone game is good, right, in the variations. I think the counter stuff is really good uh, against that UCF front. They do not do a job, a good job, in my opinion, of you know, kind of playing across guys' face 
in the gap scheme stuff. They kind of just sit there and get blocked. But I am interested in seeing how much outside zone we see from Oklahoma. I, I thought we saw some decent stuff in those concepts against Texas. And you watch UCF's defensive line. They get reached, I mean, incredibly easily. So I believe it's due. I believe the team is due. The big chunk runs are coming on Saturday, baby. Let's go. I can't wait. I cannot wait. I think uh I think everyone's probably with me on that. And yeah, I think I I think it it sets up really nicely. I kind of said the same thing. My bold prediction is that we outrush UCF, who is I think third in the country right now, running the football at like two hundred and forty five yards a game or, or so. So yeah, we need a big day running the football because I think once you once you kind of break out and start to have some success, feels like it it can become contagious and and kind of carry for the rest of the season, get some momentum going. Yeah, a few more run game thoughts. How much QB run game are we going to see with Dylan Gabriel? A lot. Uh, we we saw quite a bit against Texas, but that's Texas. Is UCF the type of team? Is this the type of matchup where Levy feels the need to call Dylan's number a lot or put him in the situations in the RPO game or in the read game where he's carrying it? Because I certainly think they can have a lot of success if they want to do it. UCF seems to lose track of the quarterback in some of those read concepts. Go watch the Kansas State game. But is it something OU needs to do in this game, right? We saw him crank it up against Texas. I, I don't know. Is that the new thought process on offense, or was that, hey, Texas is a really talented team. We need to get to more plus one runs in the QB run game. I, I don't know, but I'm interested to find out on Saturday. I think the Texas game was, hey, this is Texas. We're going to – we're going to have to find an edge somewhere to run the ball against that big defensive line. And you won the game. Now, do you need it against UCF? No, you don't. But there's something interesting that came out of that win against Texas. That's your Heisman odds. Mm. Dylan Gabriel, all of a sudden, is kind of right there knocking on the door with a group of other guys, a small group of other guys. Um, I think this is, I think you start padding the stats. If you don't think that teams do that, when it, because a Heisman is incredibly valuable for a program in recruiting, in marketing, in everything. And now that he's right there, what is he, third in the Heisman odds right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, wouldn't shock me if they do start dialing him up a lot. How about this compromise? You dial it up when you're getting close to the end zone. Yeah. Th the rushing yards for a quarterback, they are what they are. It's all about that total touchdowns number. The payoff, yep. The payoff. So maybe, maybe we could come to a compromise. Red zone run threat in this one for Dylan Gabriel. We'll see. But what I do know is... You have to make UCF's defensive backs get off blocks and tackle. If I were Jeff Lebby, and I hate picking on individual guys like this, but it just, I saw it over and over again on tape. You come up with every formation under the sun to try to get number 10, Quadric Bullard, into the run fit. Kansas did it. They went nub tied in into the boundary, Ted, and that did the trick. He's there one-on-one -on -one with running backs with high shot, just getting steamrolled. Mm. And I, I would, I mean, he's light. They need to attack him and get him into the fit. I know Levy will do it. I just hope he does it a lot because I do not think that guy wants to come downhill and make tackles. I just, I do not see that when I watch it on tape. The first, they may do it the first running play. Just they should. Say, they should say. line up Tawi Walker 
get 10 into the run fit and say, all right, good luck. It's going to be, does this look familiar to you? Here it comes. Yeah. yeah. And because you want him thinking about that all game. And once that happens, your mind starts to wonder a little bit, and then you're exposed to a bunch of other stuff. Some past game thoughts. Interested to see what UCF's coverage mentality is in this game. I don't think they are a very good zone coverage team. I think they struggle, especially at the linebacker position, uh, relating and underneath zone coverage. Uh, I think there's a lot of money to be made there in the middle of the field by a guy like Drake Stoops, Jalil Farouk. But I, I just don't think they can sit back in a two shell and not get gashed by OU's run game. So I, I'm expecting UCF to say, hey, you know what? Let's be aggressive. And their corners, their corners press quite a bit on the outside. So here's something that's that's going to be important. OU's wide receivers got to play really physically in this game. Farouk, especially on the outside, right? Because they're going to get some press man. And it's just not something you see a ton of week in and week out. So Farouk, Nick Anderson, Jaden Gibson, those guys on the outside, they're going to have to be really good with their releases off the line of scrimmage. And if they make those guys miss with their hands, there, there are some big plays in the vertical passing game to be had. Big, huge, huge plays. And we had Emmett Jones on Coach's Corner a couple weeks ago, and something he said really stood out to me. He said he wants his wide receivers playing with a linebacker mentality. That, that's what they need to bring to this game because these corners for UCF, they are going to be up in their face at the line of scrimmage, and they are going to grab them like crazy. And you can't let them grab you, right? You can't put it in the official's hands. You have to get their hands off of you. And if you do that, I'm telling you, man, some big plays down the sidelines to be had. Yeah, especially if they've got to get aggressive in the box like, like you were talking about, slanting the front adding pressure, bringing backers, bringing safeties. Um, yeah, there should be some big opportunities if you can beat some of that some of that tight coverage whenever they're pressed up. W do you expect Nick Anderson to be the guy that gets to fill in the, the Andrew Anthony hole? Yes. I, I think that, I mean, he's just so, he's shown so much. Right now, what is it? 11 catches with six touchdowns, which is just insane. But when the ball hasn't come his way, and, and I watch for stuff like that when I'm going back through the tape, reviewing the game, he's a really crisp route runner. He's got speed. He's got explosiveness. This, the ball hasn't found him a ton. And I, I think the ball is going to find him more. And now you got to have Jaden Gibson step up, Brennan Thompson. Right, interested to see when you got a guy with speed like that, you use him, right? Yep. Obviously, you use him, but I think Anderson has earned that role. Now he's going to have to continue each and every day on the practice field, each and every week to earn that role. That's that's how Emmett Jones operates. That's how Jeff Levy operates. But yeah, I think that. I don't know. I would be surprised if he doesn't run out there with the first group. Is that, is that how you feel? Yeah, no, I, I would be surprised. I think it's just, you know, kind of the pecking order that we've seen. Um, you had your starters. Nick Anderson was the guy that was next getting the most reps. And then Jaden Gibson was after that. And then we just started to see Brennan Thompson. So I would expect Nick Anderson to get starter reps. Jaden Gibson to have an increased role as a as a guy that spells or comes in. He's he's been a guy down in the red zone that they've brought in, and then as long as he's healthy and ready to go, I do expect to see Brennan Thompson out there as well. So yeah, uh, Nick Anderson should get the bulk of that. Yeah the the only other thought I have on OU's passing game in this in this matchup. I'm sorry, number ten. But attack him. And here's why. 
Anytime I see a defensive back on tape wearing a bulky-ish knee brace, I'm attacking him vertically, man. It, it's like it it might as well be just a red blinking light. <laughs> just at, you got to test it, right? So, yeah, I realize I've said, hey, pick on him in the run game, make him be in the fit, and attack him in the vertical passing game. Yeah, I I think you try to ruin number 10's day. That's where I'm at. I think he's the weak link back in, in the back end of that defense. Yeah, and, and you can uh... – like when you were talking about attacking him in the run game, uh, you can do some things to get him thinking about that and then get the matchup you want off of it and, and be able to expose it. I, I think that that's a, I think that's a good game plan and I'm sure we'll see it out there. He's, you better prove you can run with that contraption on your leg. Right. Uh, or else it's going to be a long day. Yeah. All right. Let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys for the number one thing. You'll be watching for an OU UCF. This first one comes from Monty Cisco, who says UCF is in the top five in rushing nationally. So I'll be paying attention to the front seven in regards to stopping UCF's run game. I also want to see if we can establish the run against that team after watching Kansas run for 399. I'll be disappointed if we don't rush for 250 plus. I I think that's a pretty fair assessment from our man Monty Ted. Yeah. No, I I agree. I think honestly I feel like the back when you look at the front half of the schedule, SMU had a good solid defensive front. Um Cincinnati had a really good solid defensive front. Texas had a really good solid defensive front. We know how good Iowa State's defense is. I right, we faced some good defenses early on that's going to trail off a little bit here over the next couple of games. And I fully expect our offensive numbers to increase um, now that it's going to be not quite as talented in the front seven. Yeah. This other one comes from at the boys forever who says, I'd like to see Tawi get the carries like he's the number one and give him a chance to get some kind of rhythm going. I don't know if, the bye week will change how they operate at the running back position. Ted, we, you know, after that Texas game, we came on here and said that, hey, it looks like Tawi Walker is the best running back this team has. But I absolutely has ha- have given up on this offense establishing some, you know, bell cow back. I just, I, I'm going to need to see that before I believe it. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad team, right? You're winning games. And it seems like guys are going to stay fresh as a result of the way that DeMarco Murray's been doing it. Yeah. I, I fully expect it to be Marcus Major and Tawi Walker handle, handling the bulk of the carries. Now, uh, things can change depending on what the game looks like. Um, but I think those two guys are going to get 90% of the carries unless you find yourself in blowout territory or something like that. And, you know, your other younger backs are going to get a chance to come in there. I, until I see differently, it's Tawi Walker, Marcus Major, in my opinion. I'm with you. All right, let's learn a little more about the UCF Knights with Brandon Helwig. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Loves Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals that can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamori. It's hunting time in Oklahoma. And if you're looking to buy hunting property, the land doctors can help you find the ideal ranch. They build custom hunting lodges and lakes and can turn Oklahoma's raw land into your personal playground. If you'd like to sell some land or you simply want to add to your portfolio, then call Colton Cole at 405 405- 
615-764-5 or visit LandDoctors.com. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field for after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletics events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit SchoonerAle.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. All right, here is Brandon Helwig. It is our pleasure to be joined by the man over at UCFSports.com. Brandon Helwig is in the house. Brandon, how we doing, man? I'm doing great. You know, it's it's been an interesting season for UCF. It's been a lot of fun. First year in the Big 12. Uh, there's been three games so far. Been a couple of fun road trips to Kansas. But as far as the wins and losses in the Big 12, it's kind of been a, a rough start for the Knights. And uh, we'll see what happens this Saturday. But I know a lot of UCF fans are excited to be making their first ever trip to Norman. Now you guys have been in a little bit of a of a rebuild phase and transition into the conference. Like what's been the biggest difference that you've noticed so far? Yeah. You know, you can call it a rebuild transition. I think UCF thought there would be less of a rebuild transition to going into the big 12. I mean, don't get me wrong. No one thought it was going to be easy, but I think, and in the the first half of the schedule was a little bit top heavy in terms of the teams they were going to play. But I, I just think, just some of the trends in the first three games, you know, UCF opens up the season. They go on the road to Kansas State. Obviously, defending Big 12 champs, great environment, tough team. And we saw what they did last week. And, you know, UCF, they they competed. You know, they had a lead in the third quarter, one position, one possession game in the fourth quarter. You know, they had had chances. Of course, UCF's uh, starting quarterback, John Rice Plumley, he's been out since the, you know, end of the second game. So they're rolling with a backup quarterback. So that was, you know, you know, they felt pretty good after that game, even though it was still a loss. But just these last two games, man. Baylor, the home opener, I, it's, you know, we've seen a couple of these colossal meltdowns this season. That was maybe the first one. Uh, UCF's leading, you know, 35 to 7, 35 to 10 in the fourth quarter. Just everything that could go wrong went wrong. You know, strip fumble, you know, return for a touchdown, just could not stop Baylor. They lost that one. Um, you know, of course, we've seen, you know, the other day, you know, Colorado and Stanford had a similar uh, outcome. Boise State and Colorado State. And then uh, two weeks ago at Kansas just was dominated in every step of the way. The defense just has not been able to stop anybody rushing the ball, gave up 399 rushing yards to Kansas um, offense. Look, look discombobulated. I uh, just, this was not a kind of a good vibe following that one. So I, I know they, they like having the bye week, but I know for fans, they're just, they're just kind of want to get to this next half of this, this schedule, maybe after OU to see if there's a chance for them to win three more games and get bowl eligible. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out for the Knights, Brandon. But I uh, want to talk to you about the offense first. Uh, saw that Gus Malzahn said that they expect John Rice Plumley to be the guy for this game on Saturday. H- how healthy do you think he is? Because he did not look like himself to me two weeks ago against Kansas. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are wondering why did he – why did they roll him out there against Kansas when you know you have the bye week after that game? So that'd be an additional week for him to get healthy. Uh, a lot of people were kind of second questioning that move, but he was technically cleared. He clearly wasn't a hundred percent. He was wearing a knee brace. And the thing about John Rice Plumley, uh, he's not a pretty typical drop back quarterback that can kind of, you know, get by with a knee brace. What makes him so good is his running ability. And when you kind of take that away or when it's not a hundred percent, yeah, he, he struggles. We saw it last year when he had a, had a hamstring problem. He's not the same quarterback. Uh, so it was kind of a weird deal. He starts the game at Kansas. I think he plays two plays, like the first two plays of the game. He hears or feels a pop in his knee and he gets, you know, kind of freaked out. Like, did I, did I just seriously injured my knee again? So he goes back to the sideline. They get it checked out. He comes back, I think, a couple series later, three and out. And then at that point, we don't see him again. So, you know, (laughs) the defense had a huge problem in that game, but the offense was just discompopulated from the start. And so now we've had a bye week. 
he walks into the press conference on Monday. He's wearing this huge brace on his knee. He says he's going to wear a brace on Saturday. So, yeah, we wonder, is it going to be the same John Rice Plumley we saw before the injury? I mean, I, it's hard to imagine. Like he's dealing with a knee. They never said what it is, but we're pretty sure it's a knee strain. So it'll be interesting because, you know, UCF needs a healthy John Rice Plumley if they want to have a chance. Uh, I agree. Um, that first throw he had against Kansas was beautiful, though. Um, <laughs> they they can't replicate that with the backup. And, th- you know, whenever you pop a knee that's been injured, they just tell you, how oh, it's scar tissue. That's all that yeah. is. Yeah, that's what they told him. <laughs> he was worried. He called <laughs> it what snap- they said? Sna- he said it was like a snap, crackle, pop. And he was really freaked out about it. But they said it's just scar tissue moving around because he's getting active for the first time. So, well, what do you, what do you expect? It, okay. He's going to start the game, but what do you think? Are they going to try and protect him maybe a little bit more than they typically would given the injury and maybe try and keep him in the pocket, even though that's not his strength? I mean, you would think so. Um, I mean, we'll see what, what, what happens. I mean, UCF has a pretty good running game. I think some people thought, you know, there was an early deficit at Kansas, thought maybe they should have stuck with the run game a little bit more. They got two talented running backs, um, RJ Harvey, Johnny Richardson. I think Johnny Richardson has had a lot of, you know, home run type, you know, carries this year. He had, he got a 79 yard touchdown uh, against Baylor. Uh, but yeah, you would think so. Um, it just, yeah, we're all just kind of wondering, cause you know, <laughs> How effective is he going to be if he can't run the ball? And technically, honestly, the backup quarterback, Timmy McLean, he did decently well for the position he was thrown into, um, you know, starting, I guess, the next three games after John Rice got hurt. He's probably he's probably has a he has a better arm, honestly. Um, you know, he can throw the deep ball. They connected on some some deep balls that I don't know if John Rice can make those throws. The thing that I think frustrates coaches about Timmy McLean is just, you know, awareness decision making because there's been some really costly turnovers in these games I mean you can put in that Baylor game that was a total collapse on all three phases um you can point to a lot of people you know a lot of things that happen say if this play is made UCF doesn't lose that game but I, I'm pretty sure the coaching staff really probably was harping on Timmy McLean because he threw a really bad pick they were about to score a touchdown I think late in the third quarter and he threw an interview there was a guy wide open in the corner of the end zone he holds on to it too long throws it last second, you know, short on his throw. It's an interception. So I, I know they they were wanting to get John Rice back because they know he'll make better better decisions back there. But you just you just hope they're not rushing him back too quickly. Now with Plumley being limited still with his mobility, it's going to be important that that offensive line plays at a high level. What what are your expectations for that group going against this Oklahoma defensive line? I mean, I, I mean, maybe it's we'll see how they fare against the Oklahoma defensive line, which is pretty good in their own right. They've done decently well this year. Uh, the offensive line, uh, you know, they patched, you know, like everyone else these days, they patched together a few transfers. There were some question marks at center. They started, you know, one guy he had trouble with false starts, so they replaced him with another guy. You know, guy gets a sprained ankle, another guy comes in there, but you know, they've done decently well on the offensive line this year. Um, they're still, you know like to have a little bit more continuity because there's been a couple guys who've been, you know, you know, sprained ankles and stuff like that. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. This is, <laughs> it's going to be their biggest test. Uh, their biggest test. So, so far going against the OU. So I don't know. <laughs> what do you expect um, in the passing game? Uh, well, it looks like it's very matchup oriented. Um, what wide receivers do you think maybe yeah. have a chance to have the best game? Yeah, you know, um, you said for the most part, um, it's really just three receivers or really just two that are going to get the bulk of of throws their way. Uh, Kobe Hudson, he was off to a, a really hot start this year. He's a former uh, Auburn transfer, uh, was recruited there by Gus Malzahn. I think he was kicked off the team when Brian Harson got there. And so he he comes down to Orlando and, and you know, last year was kind of up and down for him, but he was off to a really hot start. I think he had a tree, a three consecutive hundred yard plus receiving games. And he's kind of disappeared a little bit more the last couple games, um, whether just matchups or, you know, being covered or just not just whatever the reason was, just didn't get the ball like he did in the previous three. Javon Baker is another guy you'll probably see a lot of. He's another former SEC transfer from Alabama. Um, and Xavier Townsend uh, plays that slot role. So those are really the primarily the the top three guys that'll that'll see uh, you know, get balls thrown their way. Um, you know, it, we really, the thing about John Rice Plumley though, 
you know, we talk about him, you know, being healthy and all this stuff. We haven't really seen him at full strength because this was a big year for him. A lot of people don't understand. He, he's an older player. He's experienced, but he was at Ole Miss and he didn't play quarterback. He was actually playing wide receiver, you know, his last year at Ole Miss. So he comes to UCF last year playing quarterback. And that was the first time he was in a lot of these situations. He had never really been a full-time starting quarterback before. And so there was a lot of hype this, this summer, this off season that he had, you know, taken a huge step forward and we saw it early, but I mean, you see playing Kent state. I mean, they knocked the socks off those. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to draw conclusions. Yeah. He looked great, but it's Kent state. And in that Boise state game, which was week two, if you just look at the score, you look at the box score, it doesn't look that impressive, but John Rice played really well in that game. There was, they sh you see it shouldn't have been a game at the game. You had to kick a field like a walk-off field goal to win the game. That should have never happened. There were two touchdowns that he threw. I mean, they were touchdowns. The two of those receivers I just mentioned, this was uncharacteristic for them. The ball like hits them in the chest and they just they don't catch it. it, it you know, they they bobble the ball, you know, goes in the air and it's in the right spot for the Boise guy to intercept it. And that didn't happen just one time, that happened twice. Um, so it, when we saw John Rice, you know, when he can run, he can throw, he was hundred percent. He looked really great. I would have been excited to see what he could do against big 12 defenses when he's 100%. So that's just kind of the other element of it. We haven't really, we had, I don't really have a sense of, of the um, true improvement that he's made. Cause we heard he made a significant jump uh, this year. Yeah, that's interesting. Now looking at the defensive side of the ball for the Knights, with what you've seen up to this point, what, what do you think the the biggest strength of this defense is well the the biggest strength may be the secondary but that may be maybe that's because teams realize they don't have to throw the ball if they can run it pretty much every down and you see it can't stop it so the secondary doesn't have to defend passes very often i mean that's honestly what happened um at kansas like on the stats right in front of me i don't even think i'm not even sure if they threw the ball in the second half when they realized they could just run it every single down and UCF can't stop them. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, I think, you know, people were confident. People liked UCF's defensive line coming into the season. They haven't been a hundred percent, arguably their best defensive tackle, Ricky Barber. He's been, you know, he's been injured for much of the season. He did not play at Kansas. Like, just like John Rice Plumley though, that he's, he's supposed he's back. You know, they say he's back in full go for OU. So, That'll be a big positive for for the for the D line and particularly that run defense that they like I said they were gashed for 399 yards against Kansas, and um, I think even Nevada, you know, arguably now the worst team at FBS. I think they held they held Kansas to a much lower uh, rushing yardage earlier this season. So yeah, I, you know, it's it's probably I'll tell you what the strength is not. It's linebacker. That's really been the, the crux of everything this year for UCF. They maybe have one decent linebacker and they just have had nobody else that can step up and play there. What's been the storyline down there surrounding uh, Dylan Gabriel coming to Oklahoma to face Dylan Gabriel? Obviously um, had a lot of success there previously. Is, is that been a been big talking point for you guys? Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of been a talking point, not just this week, but ever since UCF joined the Big 12. And when we found out the Big 12 schedule, you know, and UCF was going to play OU, I think a lot of UCF people obviously would have, you know, wished the locations were reversed and he was coming down to Orlando because that would have been interesting. What kind of reception would he have gotten here? Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing because the thing about Dylan Gabriel is, you know, that was, you know, 2021, you know, first year of the portal and NIL and all that stuff. And he was really big into that, you know, you know, you know, NIL, when it first started, it was all about marketing your, your, your t-shirts and your self endorsements, that the whole collective element hadn't really taken root. Like it, it didn't take long, but it hadn't really hadn't taken root yet. You know, you see the t-shirt behind me, he was marketing his own merchandise brand, uh, DG, the brand dedicated to greatness. And so I just think a lot of UCF fans didn't know how to take sort of what is more commonplace now in college football because he got hurt. I think it was the third game, last play of the game at Louisville, broke his collarbone. So he was out for a while. And I think later in the season, you know, whether you know he would ever admit it or not, I think it was it was said that he was cleared and he could have returned. But, you know, he hadn't played four games and we, we know we know now the deal. If you haven't played your four games, you probably want to hold on to that and you want a red shirt. And so he'd already got in his mind that he was going to transfer. Um, 
I don't know if he was a huge fan of the new coaching staff because that was the first year with Gus Malzahn and, and he was tied with Jeff Levy and, and he was actually a big proponent for Jeff Levy to get the head coaching job at UCF because he did interview. So he had it in his mind at some point that year that he was going to transfer. And so there was a lot of you know buzz and rumors and stuff, kind of a lot of drama that whole season. So a lot of fans were were upset about it. I think people have gotten o- gotten over it. Um, but I, I don't I don't know if anyone's going to be necessarily rooting for him, you know, after this week. Brandon, well, we appreciate the time, man. Are you are you making the trip to Norman? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. It's um, it'll be a lot. I don't know if UCF and OU will ever play again. So this will be actually this is a big trip for UCF fans. Like there's there's going to be at least, probably at least a couple thousand or more. You know, I, I know there's a one nonstop a day on Southwest um, from Orlando to Oklahoma City. I know this this flights are completely full of UCF fans. So there'll be a good at least a good UCF contingent for a team that that can't can't drive there anyway. They have to, everyone has to fly. Well, we we appreciate the time, and hopefully we'll see you Saturday, man. Thank you. I'll see you guys. Thanks for having me. Well, Brandon sounds excited to make the trip, but I don't think he thinks it's going to go very well for UCF. No, I don't think so. Uh, I am curious to see what, what type of uh, group they bring. I mean, he sounds to be uh, pretty optimistic. There's going to be a decent group coming. I was thinking it was going to be a friends and family game for UCF, but um, maybe they show up decently. Yeah, we'll see. They'll be easy to spot. They'll be yes. in black and gold. Shouldn't be hard yes. to find. All right, let's 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 preview some of these great games in week eight of college football. But first... John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full-service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you, and they'll give you $500 off. That's $500 off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family-owned and operated, and no matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. Carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all the information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from the insurance carriers that compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. Week 8 in college football. Big one in the Big Ten. Number 7, Penn State is going to number three, Ohio State. This game is 11 a.m. Central on Fox. Currently, Ohio State is a a four-and-a-half-point favorite. Ted, there is going to be talent all over the field on this game. In this game, future pros everywhere. And I won't lie, man, I think Penn State is the better team at the line of scrimmage with what I've seen. I think they are very capable of going and winning this game. Am I a crazy person? No. James James Franklin is one in eight against Ohio State. He's never beaten Ohio State in Columbus. And a large part of me thinks they're going to go win. Yeah. It's going to be their best opportunity. Um, He's not going to have a much better team than he's got right now. And although Ohio State's really good, I mean, this is about as down as we've seen them where it's not a a sure thing. I think McCord is looking better. 
I think their defense is definitely looking better, but they're gettable. Um, Penn State's going to have to go in, run the football really well. Uh, I, they've got to play a super clean, smart football game. They can't have special teams mistakes. They can't have turnovers, and they got to be able to run the ball. If they can do that, they've got a really good shot. Penn State, that turnovers killed them in this game a year ago. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at their run game, they have not had the explosive runs with Allen and Singleton that I think they expected to have. But on the other side of things, Ohio State is banged up at running back. It's it's a bit of a mystery who's going to play at running back for them. So uh, I think that is... That's a huge factor in this game. I expect Kyle McCord to make some big plays in the passing game. He's got Marvin Harrison Jr. Right? I mean, they're going to make some plays, and we'll see if Abuka can go. He's been banged up. But I think this game is going to come down to Drew Aller in some key situations. He's going to have to make some big-time throws in high pressure situations where he is either getting hit or getting pressured by that really, really strong Ohio state defensive line. I Penn state's offensive line is going to have to hold up well enough against that group to give him time to attack. What I believe is the weakness of Ohio state's team. And that's the secondary. So I I am expecting a great football game. I, I kind of view it. I think it's going to be a little lower scoring, but I'm expecting something similar from a competitive standpoint as what we saw from Washington and Oregon last week. Like that's the type of game that like, that's the type of level of competition I'm expecting in this one. I think it, I will be really surprised if it's not a great football game. Totally agree. Um, if James Franklin can't beat Ohio State with the team he's got this year, it ain't happening, right? I mean, this is a this is the best that they've been. Now they've been good and they've been on this slow like uptick. Last year was a good solid year for him. But I you got to get past like there's like a mental block there, you know? And if they can't get past it, it's almost like they're going to be doomed to be third place in the big 10 for eternity. Uh, you got to get over the hump. You got to win one of these. Uh, you got to go out there on the road. It's going to be a tough football game. You got to play smart. You got to be physical and you're going to have to have a couple of your big time players show up. I mean, that's all there is to it. I mean, you got to give the edge to Ohio state for being at home. I think you give the edge to Ohio state, obviously because of, um, you know, the recent record against Penn State. And I think you give Penn or Ohio State the edge talent wise. But that's how it's, you still got to go win it. I mean, that's how it's always going to be with Penn State against Ohio State. That doesn't mean that you can't win the football game whenever they've got the edge in those, those categories. They just got to go, like, turnovers are going to be the killer. They have to win the turnover battle or it's it's just not going to happen. And it may not be close. If they go in there and turn the ball over three times, they may get their asses kicked. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. The interesting part for me is Penn State's strengths on defense match up really well to Ohio State's strengths on offense. Right? They haven't run it particularly efficiently offensively. They got just dudes everywhere at wide receiver, though. Yeah. But Penn State, they may have the best corner tandem in all of college football. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of fun things to watch in this game. I am – I'm fired up. Who who you got winning it? Ohio I, State. I'm, yeah, I'm taking Ohio State. It's one of those I'm going to have to see it before I believe it situations with James Franklin going and winning to Columbus because he's never done it. If 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 they don't beat him this year, I just don't see it happening. Aside from like a one-off where they upset him, but when you've got a really good team 
Penn State, and you're going up against Ohio State, like this is as close talent-wise as it's been in a really long time, as long as I can remember, I you got to be able to go get it done or it's not going to happen. I mean, I don't know. James Franklin has won a lot of football games there. He hasn't won a whole lot of big football games there. No. Things have not gone well against Michigan and Ohio State for James Franklin. And the fun part about this game, no matter what team loses, there's going to be a lot of discourse around the head coach. Yes. Right. Because Ryan Day, the whole thing has been, well, he's lost to Michigan a couple times in a row, but he doesn't lose to anyone else. They start losing to Penn State. Watch out now, especially in Columbus. Watch out now. And then if Penn State goes and gets beat again, I I assume that fan base is just going to be like, are we ever going to beat this team? with this guy as the head coach. So it's going to be fun either way, man. No, I agree. It's um, somehow Franklin has largely been able to skip the, like the negative press, you know, losing to Ohio state or Michigan. But I, now that he's got like, that's one of the problems with having the, one of the better teams that you've had in a while is the expectations are going to catch up with you and it's like okay well now talent wise it's as close as it's ever been go get it done but you're you are supposed to be able to bridge the gap you know that's why you make as much money as you do whenever we play some teams that maybe have a little bit more talent like coaching wise we should be able to at least level the playing field got to go do it i'm with you all right Looking at our next game, number 17, Tennessee travels to Tuscaloosa to take on number 11, Alabama. I don't know why I said Alabama like that. These SEC people are rough. Alabama, 230 on CBS. Bama is a nine and a half point favorite. Ted, when I look at these two teams, I feel like these are two teams that want to play a similar style right now i think they want to lean on their run games they want to pick their spots take some deep shots in the passing game but i think both of these teams want to rely on the strength of their football teams and that's their defenses i will be shocked shocked if this game looks like it did a year ago right remember that track meet yeah this is going to be like a this is going to be like a a 14-17 game or something, right? That's how it feels. And when I look at the matchup, I think the key is which quarterback makes the critical mistake or the critical mistakes. Because Tennessee cannot afford for it to be Joe Milton and Bama can't afford for it to be Jalen Milrow. Right? I think Tennessee's run game has looked better than Bama's. I'm just, man, with what I've seen from Bama's offensive line, I'm just not confident enough in that group to play at a consistently high level to dominate this Tennessee team that's playing this well on defense. I I looked at this spread and I went, what? They're, I'm missing something because it feels like Tennessee plus nine and a half is free money. I, I just may, – maybe Joe Milton's going to be horrible. Maybe that's the case. But the he way that they're be. running it and the way that they're playing defense, I think this is going to be a ball game, man. Well, the interesting thing about it is I, nine and a half – for instance, last year in this game, nine and a half is not a whole lot of points, right? But with two offenses that – haven't scored nearly as much as they did a year ago nine and a half points feels like just like an avalanche of points i i'm with you but i also know that anytime something looks like this it's like there's something going on like the west virginia 
uh, Houston spread, right? I felt like that. Oh, come on. Houston, no way. But I, whenever you look at the Alabama's SEC games, 24 they put up against Ole Miss. Um, they did score 40 against Mississippi State, but 26 against Texas A&M, 24 against Arkansas. This team does not score a lot of points. And I just I, that's why I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. And in a low-scoring game, I think like the number should be more like four and a half than nine and a half. Yeah, I am. But there's I don't some know. Binge factor in there too. And I will say that I do think that Alabama is a lot better than what most people think they are. All right, there's this because of the loss to Texas, and then they followed it up with that South Florida game. The overwhelming mantra out there has been, "Oh, Alabama's down. the The run with Nick Saban is over." And I think they've kind of enjoyed that obscurity a little bit. Instead of being out in the spotlight, they've been kind of uh, able to to run a little bit behind the scenes and. I think their their defense has gotten way better. So, low scoring game. I think Alabama wins it, but I don't know if they can cover the nine and a half. Yeah. I I completely agree. Now watch them go win by three touchdowns. Be like, oh they might. yeah, they might. Who knows? Uh, you got anything else on that game? No, I definitely think Alabama wins, and there's gonna be there's gonna be some payback going on in this game. This one's gonna be it's going to be hot yeah. after last year. Yeah. Remember, that's the game where they threw the goalposts in the river, right? Yeah. That yeah. was awesome. Threw that the goalposts awesome. in the river, stormed the field with all the Bama players out there. That was awesome. And Bama's going to remember it. No doubt. All right, last game. Number 14, Utah, travels to take on number 18, USC. Uh, This game is 7 p.m. on Fox. USC is currently a seven-point favorite. Now, I believe Oregon and Washington are the two best teams in the Pac-12. But this is still a very important game in the Pac-12 race with how this thing could end up shaking out. This feels like a Pac-12 elimination game, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Uh, um, and when I look at the two teams, USC's got, they, they've got more talent that they, they still, despite how bad Caleb Williams played in the Notre Dame game, they still got the best player in college football on their team. But this game, this is a culture game for me. Would I be surprised at all if Utah goes into the Coliseum and pushes USC around at the line of scrimmage? No. Not one bit. Would I be surprised if Caleb Williams is running for his life like he was against Notre Dame? Nope. Would not surprise me at all. We we saw Utah push them around two times a year ago. Now, in the Pac-12 championship game, Caleb Williams got hurt. But I don't know, man. I Seven points? I just don't I, – I think this is going to be another close football game. I know that not having Cam Rising is it, – it's a huge blow for Utah. There's no doubt about it. But it's a culture game. Man, I just have a ton of respect with what for what Kyle Whittingham has built there at Utah. I agree. I think the wrong team is favored in this football game. I think Utah should be favored, not Southern Cal. Um, Caleb Williams was essentially eliminated from the football game against Notre Dame, and it was an ass whipping. Um, I don't think Utah will be able to eliminate him from the game like Notre Dame did, but I still believe that without Caleb Williams, USC is not even a top 25 team. I don't even think they're close to a top 25 team. Um, 
And I think Utah knows that. I think everyone everyone knows that. It's just whether or not you can slow him down enough. And I think Utah can. And I still think that USC's biggest threat right now, and you're right when you say it's a culture game, Lincoln Riley put all his eggs in one basket. That was the transfer portal basket. Thinking that will make up the the deficit in talent in the near term with the transfer portal. And once we have some established wins, we'll come in and hopefully be able to recruit who we need to fill in the gaps. Well, the problem is the recruiting has not been what they expected early on. And the transfer portal has created a locker room where say what you want i mean i'm sure that everyone says the right thing and and wants to do the right thing but you have a bunch of individuals there's not a whole lot of guys on this football team that i mean you know what it's like gabe you come in with the same recruiting class uh, you grow up together you go through the struggles of of being freshmen and learning the grind and the older you get, you're going to lose some guys here and there, but that tight core is always really the center of every football team. And I don't think they have that. And with all of the negative attention they've gotten over the last couple of weeks, that fractures way quicker whenever you don't have the tight core in the locker room. That's what I think they're really going to be fighting down the stretch. Like there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, Caleb Williams got his entourage that's always talking about the NFL. And I saw this morning that the new word is wherever he gets drafted, he wants to have partial ownership of the football team. Okay. That's, it's just, it's, it's distraction, right? There's all of this distraction going on and, I, I wonder how quickly are guys going to start worrying about positioning themselves for their, their own future. And while maybe that's smart for some guys, it's not good for the core of your football team. I think that's what they're really going to be fighting down the stretch here because they're going to take some losses. Now, they may be able to pull it off against Utah. I favor Utah to win the football game, but if they don't, is that thing going to fall apart on them? That's a, it's a great question, man. And it's, that's why I've labeled it as a culture game. Like how, how does USC bounce back? The culture war, a culture war. (laughs) How does, how does USC bounce back from the embarrassment of a weekend ago? Right. I, I expect Caleb Williams to bounce back in a big way. He's a really good football player, but the Trojans' defense, they're going to get a big dose of Jaquindon Jackson and Sione Vaki. Those are big physical backs for Utah. So I, I would assume Utah's plan is to lean on that run game and not ask Bryson Barnes to do too much. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be Barnes yeah. at quarterback. It's who we saw in their last game. But, yeah, I – there's just there's no way with what I know about Utah and what I know about USC, there's no way I'm laying a touchdown on the Trojans. Mm-mm. Especially not after what we saw a week ago. There's no way. I, I don't think I think Notre Dame's a better team than Utah. Mm-hmm. Right now, if Utah was completely healthy, that's a different discussion. But I don't think Utah's that far off from what the Irish have. Right. So uh, Trojans better buckle that chin strap, chin strap and be ready to go. Yeah. And and everyone's going to smell blood in the water right now with USC as well. Right. I didn't, did you watch any of the, any of film on the Notre Dame USC game? Because, you know, I watched the whole game on TV. You can't see what they're doing coverage wise on TV. And I know that that had a big part to do with, obviously, the interceptions, but 
he was under so much pressure because he was holding the football for so long. I, he, I don't know what they were doing on the back end. There, when, when I watched their passing game, and yeah, I went and watched it because I was curious. They don't have many layups for Caleb Williams. Or if they have them, he's not taking them. Right? You think just rhythm passing game, three-step, hit your back foot, ball out. Five-step, hit your back foot, ball out. It seems like they have none of that. It's all drop back, wait, 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 look around, scramble around, make a play. It, their passing game feels very disjointed to me. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a weakness of Caleb Williams. I agree. Because in college, I think it's a bailout. It, it's harder to get the snap, have your timing, trust the the read, and let it rip. And maybe you're throwing to a spot, and the guy's going to run into it. What's easier for him is to sit in the pocket. He's got his eyes downfield, but he's really watching the rush. And as soon as he sees an area of weakness in the rush, he escapes out and waits and waits for the deep the secondary to break down and then he makes a throw like that's good until you face a defensive line that can chase you down and not let you out like Notre Dame right he he couldn't do that as well against Notre Dame because they kept getting to him and they kept getting their hands on him and it wasn't as easy just to run around the corner and buy yourself an extra 5 seconds out on the perimeter I think that's a weak, a real weakness is, of his. And if I was evaluating him as an NFL team, I, I think, I think he's gotten in a bad habit of doing that way too often. I, not I to agree. say that he can't do the other things, he can, but I feel like he's, he's put himself in a really bad spot by doing it so much that that's what he's used to and always looking to do. Totally agree. Anything else on that game? Nope. I would, I'd take the points with Utah. <laughs> That's some big ones, though. It's another good week, college football, man. There's some big games out there. No doubt. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, do you have difficulty sitting for long periods of time or can't lay on your side due to pain? Well, it's a hip thing, and the only person to go see is Dr. Brandon Johnson at the Hip Clinic in Oklahoma City. No matter your age, the hip clinic has the experience and knowledge to help ease your hip pain and preserve your hip joint. Don't let the pain hold you back any longer. Don't just accept a hip replacement. Call the hip clinic today at 844-KEEP-HIP or visit thehipclinicokc.com. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? The NFL, in in the dumbest move I've ever seen in my life, the Olympics have introduced flag football as a new event, okay? Which, let's, let's remember that it wasn't very long ago that the Olympics were trying to eliminate wrestling one of the the most physically challenging sports there is, one of the most discipline-oriented sports there is. These guys give their life to a sport, high school, college, international level, to try and go win an Olympic gold for nothing, for no money. This sport, it, it's an absolute grind. That's exactly what the Olympics are about. They tried to get rid of that. And now, in a move which is uh, just flooded with corruption, 
there's no doubt the NFL has greased the pockets of whoever's on the Olympic committee because there's now a sport in the Olympics that nobody plays. We don't even play it here other than, you know, little league and then summer for high school kids to try and get in front of college coaches. It's not even a thing. And I heard Tyreek Hill, he's like, and the NFL is going to talk about letting guys go and play in the Olympics, even though they're under contract. Yeah, no shit, because you pulled this whole thing off on your own. Of course, well, we're really going to think about letting them play. I mean, it's smart by the NFL. They're trying to expand football, right? you got to keep growing. You always have to keep growing. Nobody's happy with the the billions they're making now. We've got to grow the sport. So we're going to introduce it to the world. Tyreek Hill's like, man, it would be awesome to put together like a, like a superstar team to go try and win a goal. A superstar team to play against who? The superstar flag football team from Poland? Or the superstar flag football team from Argentina. It it's a sport that doesn't exist. And it's in the Olympics. I I agree. Now, first and foremost, I'm gonna watch it when it comes yeah. around. I think you're gonna watch it. We're curious. We'll be curious as to what it I'll looks watch like. Watch it. It'll be like watching a kid with a magnifying glass around an ant hill. Is what it's gonna look like. I, I, I know there. There's like there's professional football in Germany, but there's professional football in Japan. Like there's a lot of um, uh, professional American football leagues out there. But did anyone want this? That's my no. question. That's what I'm telling you. It's the it's. The Olympics are the most corrupt. Everyone, all they do is grease the pockets to try and get your host city or host country to get it. It's all a money game. There's nobody that's been asking for flag football to be an Olympic sport. I, I'm excited that they're doing right softball. That's going to yeah. be great, right? But yeah, yeah. I. Soft diamond sports, it's a sport that's played around the world. Basketball. Yeah, no one, who, who even plays flag football around the world? Nobody. It, we don't even play it in America. The, football is the biggest sport that we have. Name the best flag football player in the world. Well, it's Tyreek Hill. He plays NFL. Or it's, you know, whatever. Justin Jefferson. Play. Yeah, you know, whatever. It's not even a, It's not even a thing. It's 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 so stupid. I mean, it's fine. I guess I'll watch NFL guys go and destroy the rest of the world. Like imagine the dream what the dream team did and what was at the ninety two Olympics to the rest of the world in basketball. Well, this will be a thousand times worse than that. But I guess the hope is that maybe it. It sparks football internationally, perhaps like that dream team situation kind of did. Yeah. I think that's the goal, right? I think I saw that the NFL is looking at possibly playing some games in Brazil, right? They're, they're really, they're trying to expand the, the footprint of the national football league, right? When it comes to the international reach, but, uh, flag football. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to get a bunch of people fired up around the world about American football. Maybe it does. I I don't know. Yeah, everyone is going to be thrilled to go out on worldwide television and get their asses absolutely handed to them by the United States, who is the only place that plays the sport that they're playing. Um, but I I'm all for the NFL expanding. And in trying to bring in, you know, there's a bunch of great athletes around the world that some places have people that are freaking suited for football. All right. Um, I think that's awesome. But don't 
pay your way into the Olympics to do it. Do it on your own. That's bullshit, in my opinion. But whatever. They're still the winner. They're still the winner. Yeah. Who do you have as your – I can't wait to hear who you have as your loser of the week. Well, the loser of the week is Dabo Savini. Mm. Okay. Uh, This was interesting. Here's his quote. We're at a point in our time, and I hate that, where people, if you don't go undefeated, you're losers. You're terrible. It's just such a terrible mindset. And honestly, maybe we need to lose a few games and lighten up the bandwagon. Sometimes the bandwagon can get a little too full. And I didn't hear this. He could have been saying this like laughingly. I don't know. But there's been a discussion since Clemson was on their their hot streak. Is Clemson a blue blood? Dabo Sweeney has just eliminated Clemson from blue blood status. Ohio State, Ryan Day has lost like four games as head coach of Ohio State. It's crazy. Like, how many Big Ten games has he lost? One? Something like that? He's lost to Michigan two years in a row. Two. That's really it, other than playoff appearances. And there's a discussion of whether or not they should keep him as the coach. That's what happens at a blue blood program, right? You shouldn't be shocked by it. You shouldn't be mad. You shouldn't say we want to eliminate some of our bandwagon fans because they're, they're too demanding of what we do. That's what being a blue blood is all about. In my mind, that's like, if if that's if that heat is too much, you can't don't talk about being a blue blood. It's you're eliminated. You're a flavor of the week. Dabo, he, I don't know if it's pride or self righteousness. I don't know what word I like how to label it. But he is being judged by the standard that he has created there. Right, you can't all of a sudden be upset about the standard now. Right, that's where I, with the things that with the things that he has said recently, right, in quotes like the one you just read, and his unwillingness to use the transfer portal up to this point, I firmly believe unless something changes, I think they're done being a true contender in college football. Mm -hmm. Right. I just think that when you are not utilizing a tool that everyone else is utilizing to bolster their roster, I I just think that you are help. you like, you are assisting your program in falling behind. He's done an incredible job there, but he needs to get out of his own way or else Clemson, they're going to be a good program, right? They're going to continue to recruit at a high level. They have awesome facilities. That stadium looks awesome. But right now, the man that built it into what it is, is holding it back, in my opinion. Yeah, and I wouldn't be shocked if it sounded like he wants to tap out for some time. Uh, and I think he said he said as much, right? He's like, I'll go do something else. Like, if we want to make this professional football or whatever, I'll go do something else. So I just – I wonder – it's always easier to climb – than it is to stay right just like in your own individual mindset like to always have the motivation to prove people wrong and to go do it and we can build this we are good enough let's stay hungry like the climb is always easier but once you're there staying on top and 
trying to find a way to maintain that is incredibly difficult. But I thought that was – if anyone else at a top school would have said it, I would have been shocked. I was not shocked when I heard Davo say it because it's kind of the uh, – it's kind of the the feeling he's been putting out there for a while, but thought that was interesting. Yeah, he should probably just worry about winning football games, <laughs> right. right? And not continuing to alienate his fan base. It's so strange. They're not going to change. I mean, you can no. The more you say that, the the more resolve they'll have. Yeah. All right. Let's get to my winner and loser of the week. But first. Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment, Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that will give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. They're Oklahoma-owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L supply.com. And First Fidelity Bank knows how to keep fans like you happy. With more than 50 awards in the last five years, including Forbes Best Best In-State Bank, the Oklahomans Community Choice Awards, and the Journal Records Reader Rankings, it's clear that they are Oklahoma's number one pick for quality banking. And you can find that level of outstanding service in everything FFB offers. Open an account at an award-winning bank today at ffb.com. First Fidelity Bank, we go where you go. And head to opolisclothing.com for a podcast, merchandise, and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. Woo, that's looking sharp. Is yeah. that thing hot off the press? Is that uh, shocked you are able to find one out there? Yeah, I got uh, one for you too, buddy. I got, I got you one. It's in the car. I'll give it to you Friday. Love it. That's O P O L. Isclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. All right, for my winner of the week, uh, I thought about going with just comfortable clothing on a golf course. Mm. Did you see Tiger Woods in the in the uh, Call of Duty hoodie? I didn't. Oh, there's this. He's just out there. It's him. He's playing with his son. There's this group of guys. I, I don't know the backstory of it, but he's got a Call of Duty Black Ops hoodie some Nike basketball shorts, and he's wearing a camo hat backwards. And it just made me think, let's normalize comfy clothing on the golf course. What are we doing? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I I don't think it would help me play any better, <laughs> but, you know, like part of it is like, let's get dressed up and act like we're pros and go out there and hack it around for a little bit. But that's cool. And it's good to see it looks like he enjoys playing whenever he's out there with his son. And I think that, you know, that can, it can become a grind whenever you do something for a living and at such a high level. So that's cool to see. Yeah. But my winner of the week, the Philadelphia Phillies. Ted, I was on the couch on Tuesday night. I was watching my thunder on one screen. I was watching the Phillies diamondbacks game on the other, by the way, thunder looked good, man. Chet yeah. looks great. Giddy was awesome. Michich. I think that guy's going to be an important piece for this team. Moves well, passes well, tight handle. Oh, I like what I'm seeing, man. I really do. But back to the Phillies. I was just hoping to watch some entertaining competitive playoff baseball, right? It's the only team, the only time all year I watch baseball. Phillies had other ideas. 10 nothing route of the Diamondbacks in game two to take a 2-0 lead in the NLCS. Sixth, sixth inning, seventh inning, just blew that thing wide open. Uh, Schwarber, Kyle Schwarber is so fun to watch for me. Dude just hits bombs. I mean, just bombs. Had two homers right. in this one. Real Muto had himself a night. What, three RBI, some clutch hits. Awesome seeing an Oklahoma guy succeed like he's succeeding. They have hit 15 home runs in their last four games. It's crazy, man. They crazy. are destroying the ball. And we've talked about it before, but Citizens Bank Park looks like one hell of a time during the playoffs. I mean, my goodness, I am. I want to go. I want to go real bad. But yeah, I was, 
you know, I was hoping to feel the the excitement, right? The tension of some playoff baseball in the NLCS. No, it was an absolute beatdown. Yeah, it looks like Philly and the Rangers are on a collision course in the World Series. Uh, Rangers looking really good themselves. What are they up on on, um, on Houston right now? So that's going to be wild. Going to be wild. And I kind of want to see Philly win it just to see how ridiculous the celebration is there in Philadelphia. I don't know. Are they still rebuilding after the Super Bowl win? I think so. I think there's light poles are still being repaired. The, I, they're a fun team to watch. Now, that game too, here's what I was taking. I was taking notes. So I always take notes, right? When I think I'm going to talk about something on the pod. Uh, one of my top notes from that game, I am very confident. Right, Aaron Nola, who is on on the mound for the Phillies, I'm very confident I would severely injure myself trying to hit his curveball. Oh my god, I was I, it was it was making me uncomfortable watching it from my couch. I was like, yeah, I don't know if I'd, I I would dislocate his shoulder or something would happen to my back if I tried to hit that. Something nothing good would come for me trying to hit that man's curve. It is filthy, dude. I I would go diving to the ground like a pansy as you know it looks like it's coming at my face and it's perfect strike Boop. yeah i that would not be something i could do and the most entertaining thing to come out of this game all right because it was a blowout not a lot of suspense Ted, you need to go check out the video of a fan running on the field and a security guard comes flying right and absolutely blast this dude on the field i mean the crowd reaction is fantastic a lot of people are comparing it just because it was in philly they were saying brian dawkins-esque with the hit oh yeah i saw that man it's a good thing he didn't go head across if he would have uh went with his head across the uh uh, the front of the body there that could have been really nasty did not see that one coming did he the fan. yeah no <laughs> he, i i think he saw that going differently in his mind it's like oh they'll grab me then they'll take me off the field no dude gets blasted if you haven't seen it go check it out all right for my loser of the week thought about going with the indianapolis colts Jim Mercer came out, said Anthony Richardson probably done for the season with that shoulder injury. Uh, Sounds like he will have surgery. Such a bummer. Uh, I think all football fans wanted to see what he could do this season. We saw it, got to see some glimpses, but I mean, that guy was banged up a lot in college and he's been nothing but banged up in his first year here in the NFL. Knee, concussion, now the shoulder. I mean, he's missing really, really valuable reps. Uh, that he was supposed to get kind of in a in a learning season for him. Not not what you're looking for if you're the Indianapolis Colts. No, and because they were going to lose games with him. Yeah. So I. Not good. It's tough. I. It happens, but it's rare that whenever you see someone that has a pretty extensive injury history that piles up that they get out of that and especially in the NFL's long of a grind as an NFL season is it's hard to it's hard to ditch that and and stay healthy for long periods of time no doubt but my loser of the week and I hate to do it to our guy I hate to do it but the Shane Bieber thing is hilarious that now uh, the season isn't going well for the Gamecocks right they're 2 and 4 they're 1 and 3 in the SEC uh, last Saturday, just a brutal loss. What well, blew a 10 point fourth quarter lead at home to Florida? Obviously, lost the game. And our guy, Shane Bieber, wasn't happy. So he kicked something and as a result, broke a boner in his foot. And here's the quote here's his quote It hurts like you know what, but I've got to show toughness and fight through it. Been one of those years. 
first of all, Shade, we love you, man. You're the best. I'm sorry the season's going the way that it is. But that this is this is hilarious. I mean, it's hilarious. You this is uh, this doesn't happen to head coaches in college football. He's like, oh, I'm pissed we lost that kick, something broken foot. I mean, I hate that it's Shane, but it's hilarious that this happened. It is. Um, I want to know what he kicked. I want to know. What's your prediction? Locker? Wood locker? Gatorade yeah. cooler? Chair. Chair is probably a chair. I think it was probably... I think it was probably uh, either the door or a ch- uh, probably a yeah chair, probably a chair in the coach's locker room. And it just got him right in the right spot to break a bone. Right mm. spot. Break the a good bone. thing for Shane is that feet injuries heal really <laughs> quickly. I, I imagine it happened like right because typically the coaches come in off the field, go right into the coach's locker room for like a quick like what are we going to say to the guys? And then they go out into the locker room. I wonder how long he was able to play it off and walk normal. Like know that he can feel it. It hurts like hell, but you can't risk uh, sitting down and, and, you know, limping around the rest of the night. I'd like to see how long he was able to pull off the show. I, if I know anything about our guy, he, he sold it. He didn't show any weakness in front of the team. But the second he got out of that locker room after the speech, he realized he'd made a grave error mm-hmm. and started limping bad. Dude, a broken bone in your foot. Brutal. He said he doesn't think he has to have surgery, so that's good. I love He said he called their, I think their head athletic trainer, and said the guy was just laughing his ass off. <laughs> so funny. Ah, we love you, Shane. You're the hey. man. A big Cox win would go a long ways in making the foot feel better this weekend. A&M, right? It is. It is October. There so you go. We'll see. We'll see if they can bounce back. Birthday shout outs. Happy first birthday to Violet Bowen. Happy 12th birthday to Camden Cox. Happy 42nd birthday to Chicken Man Bud Burt. Happy 61st birthday to Ross Campbell. Happy birthday to Kristen Packnett. Congratulations to Camry and Derek Sullivan on a successful bi-week wedding. Smart. Smart. Although your anniversary is now going to be during football season for eternity. Just so you guys know. Still smart, though. Wait, that's unselfish stuff. Good job. And happy birthday to Gavin Nadeau. Nadeau. Nado, Nado, Nado. Uh, it's got to be one of them, right? Nado, Nado. Hey, and I just put it to uh, put it together. Forty second birthday to Chicken Man Bud Burt. That's got to be Gerald Burt from Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. Go see him at Charlie's Chicken. Look at that. How about that? What a way to end episode three hundred and sixty three. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Sunday. Obviously, we'll be recapping. OUUCF. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. Enjoy the games. Until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.